Welcome back to Camel Trekking with Sophie, where I join in with Sophie Madison towards the end of her solo camel trip across Australia with camels she caught and trained herself. just now pulling into a campsite at the end of my first full day of trekking with her. So what are you looking for for this camp? Well I was kind of spying up that um, the Barty bush, I, well I still call them Barty bush, that's what they call them in WA and I like the name but otherwise they're known as prickly acacia almost everywhere else and it's one of the camel's favourite bushes to eat. So she's just stringing them out about to sit them down, she reckons the number one priority is a decent feed bush for the camels and that's that yellow one just behind there. Number two is a good place for them to have grass on the ground as well. Number three was a place where there's a, a flat area to put the gear and then finally like firewood. But basically you can't have a decent restful night's sleep if the camels haven't had a good feed so that's why it's the first priority. It's time to unload and set up camp. What do you reckon? What do you reckon? Are you looking forward to dinner? Yeah. Pack saddle her off and then love in the dirt. And that's just hobbles you got on the front there? Yeah. Just so it yeah. doesn't go so far at night. Yeah, exactly. So the hobbles mean they just can't walk as far. So it sort of keeps them out of trouble a bit. And in the morning, you don't have to look so far for them. Sophie's going off to turn the camels back a little bit closer. Once she sets up camp, she boils a cup of tea. And then if they get too far and they're just starting to get a little bit too far, she goes around the far side and herds them back towards the camp. I must admit I'm feeling pretty tired. After 22 k's, I didn't expect to feel that tired because I really wasn't carrying any weight. The camels were carrying the weight. But my legs have uh, been used to my canoe journey and I'm still really recovering <laughs> from my canoe journey as well. So I'm out of condition really and my feet are pretty soft as well. My leather boots are giving me a hard time. So anyway, I've got my sneakers on now and shorts and looking forward to eating the curry that Sophie just cooked and sitting around the fire. I'm pretty preoccupied with food at the moment because I pretty much lost all the fat off my body on this dugout canoe journey which I just got back from surviving 50 days living off the land and sea from so my mind doesn't wander far from food. They just book a motel. Anyway, oh well. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind. Sophie's on a sat phone to her mum, and uh, we're just going to head out and bring the camels in. So I'm just along as a tourist on this trip, but obviously Sophie is the one who's obviously doing this whole trip by herself. You can never relax until your camels are in camp, and even when they're in camp, you still can never fully relax. So my brain can switch off, but her brain's always active. The same way mine is when I've got a boat in the water or camels on my own expedition. Whenever she goes over to get them, she said they always just start moving that little bit further away because they just want to graze all night. But if you do let them go, they could be too far away in the morning. You don't know where they're going and you basically lose your camels, which is a real emergency situation if you're out in the desert. Sophie was telling me when we were walking today that the best decision she's made on this trip was to not rush it and do it over two seasons. You can't walk during summer, it's too hot. So you can try and rush it and squeeze it all in one go. But she decided, no, nah, I'm just going to take my time and enjoy it. And she's just in this really happy place where if she, if she wants to stay an extra day somewhere, she can. She's got time to chat to people. She's in no real rush and she's just really enjoying the adventure. So she's trained these camels from scratch, from the wild. And she reckons the most rewarding part is the process of seeing how much they've improved and how much they've grown and how much better behaved they are. 
it's a really difficult task training an animal that's so big to do what you want they're not malicious they just they've got a mind of their own and they don't necessarily want to do what a human's telling them to do so you can see those small steps that they take with the hobbles if it wasn't for those and they did get away they could cover distance faster than you can you can't catch up to them so at least you've got some chance I really don't think they're cruel in any way they just stop the animal really from running away and then making their own lives worse they're not the sharpest tools in the shed I reckon they've probably got a similar intellect to horses which you know in some ways are quite smart but they do benefit from a human looking after them particularly when a human is taking them into areas where they wouldn't normally go all my camel experience comes from Saudi Arabia and the camels there are just not as muscly as they are here in Australia even though these have a Middle Eastern origin they came from Afghanistan they've just re-evolved in the desert to be survival of the fittest like look at that hump even though that's a working camel that's carrying big loads its hump is full which basically means it's full of fat they're not really full of water the hump they're really just a fat reserve and even though this camel's walking every day all the way across Australia, it's still got a huge fat reserve because there's so much nutrient in Australian vegetation. When I was in Saudi Arabia, I not only wanted to learn about camels, but I also wanted to understand what it was like for Bedouin people when they lived and survived in the desert for extended periods with camels. So I basically limited the materials that I used in preparation for the trip and on the trip to that which Bedouin people had access to. I did improvise and make my own saddles just out of literally a tree that I had in the compound that I was living in because I didn't want to just use any normal Western equipment. And the stuff that I had to live with, like warm clothing, sleeping gear, etc., I made myself like Bedouins used to do. So I sewed together rugs out of sheep and goat skin and where possible, I just stuck to Bedouin materials. Thank you. In fact, the design of the trip was based around what Bedouins did as well because they used to survive to a large part on camel milk. So I bought a mother camel that had a baby, so it was lactating, so it could get milk. Uh, and I also took with me dates because they're a fantastic survival food. So it was a fairly difficult expedition and uh, didn't really turn out how I expected. I'll talk more about this trip in future episodes. These are the property owners. She's constantly wanting to ask permission, but it's very difficult to track people down that are ahead and you don't know the number and there's no mobile reception. So she always does her best to get permission. She did not manage to get it directly from these guys, but when the lady first rocked up, she was like, oh, what are you guys doing? And then Sophie had tried to get a hold of them and just couldn't. So now they're all happy and come down to check on them and offering food and water and, you know, what she needs. So that's part of the experience of adventure is receiving and giving generosity back to people. Sophie's cooked rice and curry and she's doing naan bread on the coals and it looks bloody yeah. good and I've just put some ghee on this looks sensational there you go, there's the naan. oh beauty thank you and we got port drunk out of a plastic oh. coke bottle super classy but you don't have to carry the glass and it doesn't break So these things you just literally warm them up or just toast them and yeah. Yeah, they're the, and they they last forever. Oh, oh yeah, pretty great. Yeah, they're good, hey. Pretty great for camping. Mmm. Yeah, just got to the point I was like, oh I just can't be bothered with the effort of doing a damper for just me. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I just find like when you do damper you get the flour on your fingers. Mmm, and then you need so much waste. water to wash it off. Mmm, that's what I was thinking too. There's no moon at the moment, so the stars are obviously incredible. And Sophie's just been living out under these stars for a whole year of this camel trek. Thank you.
Yes, the electric fence is going to be super handy. And God, it makes things like more enjoyable in terms of not having to run around after them. But it's sort of, I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of fighting against it a bit because I'm sort of not like the traditional feels way. Like, feels like a cop out. Yeah, it, it does. It feels <laughs> massively like a cop out. You like it under your ears? You like a bit of a scritchy under the ears? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> oh. So uh, it's morning time obviously and I love the clanging of the bells pretty much all night you hear the clanging of the bells and it's just such a nice just this time of the day you know the lights just on this perfect angle as far as the eye can see it's just grass and sparse trees still not that cold fairly dewy lots of burrs down in the socks but that's just comes with a course and really no rush to get going that's nice as well I always feel rushed on my expeditions every morning like I've got to get going got to make it but Sophie's got it down pat she's been doing it for more than a year so she just takes the time to herself when she has the time and she's just not rushed and she just feels relaxed Look at this, this is an amazing thing about camels. Totally, totally amazing. That is a prickly pear. So it's not just that big spike there. The base here of every single spine has all these microscopic little spines which detach into your tongue or your fingers if you touch them. Camels are social animals and they not only enjoy contact and affection with each other but they do enjoy it with humans as well and the bond that you form with them makes them much happier and it also makes them much easier to work with I'm still not as totally relaxed around these camels as I was around my own camels <laughs> but it's been like this is day three and I'm certainly starting to feel a lot more relaxed when I was in Saudi Arabia, I wasn't able to find camels that had already been trained or anyone that spoke English that was able to train me in the ways of camels. So I literally just had to buy them from scratch and train completely untrained camels how to be led and how to do an expedition basically. And I was doing it without actually knowing how to do an expedition with camels myself. So it was pretty challenging. To make matters worse, the mother camel that I bought had injured herself literally the day that I picked her up and that injury required effectively an operation on her leg and I had to give her drugs and injections of penicillin and that affected the milk that the baby camel had so that had to be given medical treatment as well which all I was having to really handle the camels fairly firmly in order to care for them and at the same time build a level of trust and a bond that I could train them. So the training was really uh, hampered by that process and I also had very limited time because I thought that I was leaving Saudi Arabia for good within a few months, which is why I continued to press into a really difficult situation without being adequately prepared because basically it was now or never and there was no chance to ever do this trip again because tourists aren't allowed into Saudi Arabia. Once you leave there after working there, you just can't come back. You're like a little goat. Or a big goat. So, have you found any bush tucker on your travels? Um, yeah, actually, this this year uh, there was heaps of ruby red salt bush. There was all seemed to be out and out and berries, and that's one of my favourite ones because it actually does taste good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're tiny though; they're like they're just the size of like a pinhead but they were all in fruit this year after the rains and there was red ones, purple ones, yellow ones, orange ones, just tons of them. So yeah, I was going about collecting those. They're my sort of go-to that you can just pick on the trail as you walk. So if you picked that as being a Karajong, I didn't pick it because it looks so different to the other ones I've seen, but this is a pretty cool bush tucker tree as well. Ah, I just dropped them. So these are the Karajong seed pods. I'm used to finding much larger ones. And they're normally, you know, 10 times the size of this. 
there's actually no seeds in these ones, they've all come out. But these ones are great because you, um, you break them open and there's like these little nasty hairs on them which you just got to rub off. And then you cook them up and they taste like popcorn. But yeah, it's a pretty awesome tree, the Karajong. Um, the sap you can use for insect repellent. If you did cut into the bark here and pull away that inner bark, you can make string out of it. I'd do it there, but it seems a bit of a shame to do that to the tree and I don't have my big knife with me anyway. Um, the little baby ones, you can eat the tap roots. So you'll just see them poking out of the ground when they're about that high. And then underneath them, there'll be like a little tap root that goes down like that. It's like a carrot, but it's kind of like shaped white. It doesn't taste that great, but it's, it's edible if they're small enough. And uh, yeah, you can use the wood to make like fire in the traditional method as well. So pretty versatile tree. And they all these different kinds of them. So you've got like southern varieties down here, which look totally different to the northern varieties. But they pretty much all have the same seed pods and properties. I'd show you a close-up of the leaves, but I can't because that camels have eaten everything within reach <laughs> off the entire tree. These prickles are bloody terrible everywhere around here. A brush is like such a handy thing. So this is what you're dealing with. Just these things everywhere. Their mouths are another thing which are pretty interesting. Like, I don't know whether you can get a shot of it, but like... The top of the palate. Like the papillae, or the little tentacles on the inside of the camel's mouth. Like they have all those little, you know, like the octopus tentacles in the, in the um, inside of their mouth. Yeah. Which are like, we have them in our mouths apparently, I think they're called papillae and they basically help move food back into the mouth for chomping. Oh right, but yeah. they're just much larger. And you they're just much them. larger in a camel, hey. Sophie's procedures and the way she goes about pretty much everything in her daily routine is just so down pat and professional looking. And I've taken a lot of people into the outdoors and I've been in the outdoors a lot, I've been amongst a lot of people who do expeditions and I've really never seen anyone so comfortable about what they're doing. And probably that has a lot to do with the fact that she's been doing it for a year and I haven't met anyone doing a year long expedition, even though this expedition is spread over two years. So the question is how did she get like that other than a year of practice? Like how did she have the confidence to do that, you know, to even start this journey? And I asked her, what was the first time you ever went camping overnight by yourself? And she came into camping and the outdoors fairly late in life, in, the, in her 20s, because her family didn't do it. So she just decided that she wanted to get into the outdoors and she set herself a goal of doing an overnight camp. And she didn't just pick one overnight, she picked a nine day hike of the Heisen Trail. And a lot of that is pretty remote. And she didn't have any experience and she was assisted by someone else with the equipment and the gear that she should take. But really, she took a large step outside her comfort zone. It ended up paying off, but the common factor is she stepped outside her comfort zone. And with so many adventures and progressing to bigger adventures, you just constantly step an appropriate amount outside your comfort zone. And if you keep doing that over time, you end up having a comfort zone which is quite large and you've really got to step up to a quite a big adventure to get outside it again. And each time it, the rewards just continue and that's really where she's at now. Her comfort zone is probably quite large now and she's really enjoying the benefits of, of being comfortable now in something that would initially have taken her right outside her comfort zone. Thanks so much for watching episode two. I hope you're enjoying this short trip with Sophie as much as I did because it was bloody awesome. In the next episode, we're going to look at how some of the hardships that she's had to face on this trip have changed her and improved her from a psychological standpoint. Please remember to subscribe if you're enjoying these videos and look forward to seeing you on the next one.